It's a real joy to be here to mark the 700th anniversary of St. Thomas's canonization at the Angelicum, no place better. Um, I'm also very grateful to Notre Dame doctoral student Tyler Castle, who helped me with the research for this paper, and to my sister Elizabeth, who helped with excellent editing help. So any infelicities are mine. <laughs> but um, but uh, I'll begin my talk really by, by thanking St. Thomas. Uh, and this can loop back to our discussion yesterday about the relationship between the Jesuits uh, and St. Thomas Aquinas. So I have a historical anecdote that will update it in some respect. Um, so yeah, preparing for this conference has helped me remember how much I personally owe St. Thomas. Uh, many years ago, my father, Bert Keyes, a young professional from Kansas City, Missouri, spent a summer working in Topeka, Kansas. He had graduated years earlier from Rockhurst, the Jesuit university in Kansas City. And that summer, he was doing some research on the side for one of his professors, Father Joseph Freeman of the Society of Jesus, on the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, Dad went to the Topeka Public Library, and the reference librarian there, who had no idea how to help him in his research, called another librarian, Sheila O'Connor, to help. He said, Sheila is Catholic, so she might know. <laughs> Sheila happened to be a close friend of my mother, Elizabeth Passman, and invited her over for dinner to meet Bert. They were engaged and married soon after, and here I am. <laughs> so thank you, St. Thomas, also for, for that. Um, I'll, I'll also add, when Aunt Sheila, my mother's friend who introduced my parents, died, Decades later, it was on the Feast of St. Thomas Aquinas. So he's very, very good to his friends. Uh, this was not top of my mind, though, when as a doctoral student at the University of Toronto, my primary research interests moved from classical Greek political thought to the Christian classics of Augustine and Thomas Aquinas. Uh, as a professor at Notre Dame, later I devoted my first book to Aquinas' thought uh, and my second to Augustine's. And um, so here we are at the Ange, and, and uh, yeah, coming, it's a joy also for me with this paper, it's, it's the first chance I've had in a real substantive way to return to St. Thomas. Um, and the focus of this conference paper then will be, um, so St. Thomas Aquinas, Master of Patristic Wisdom, Augustine, with a focus on the city of God. Um, and I'll especially focus on its most famous section for political theory, which is Book 19 and the way Aquinas incorporates it into his Secunda Pars. The past half century from the 1960s to the present has seen a revival in the Augustinian dimensions of Aquinas' thought. I'll begin by summarizing some of this seminal work as a foundation on which to build my reflections. I'm indebted in this task to an excellent introduction and literature review, uh, which you can find in a book called Aquinas the Augustinian which is edited by Michael Dauphiné, Barry David, and Matthew Levering. In his masterful study, St. Thomas Aquinas, The Person and His Work, um, and we've heard a lot about volume two, my references will all be from volume one, so to, to balance that. Jean-Pierre Torrell notes that Aquinas worked in the tradition and spirit of Augustine as well as Aristotle. Torrell approvingly recalls J. M. Ramirez's observation of, quote, an increasing influence of St. Augustine in Thomas's thought as it comes, comes into its maturity, end of quote. Themes in which Torrell finds this augmented Augustinian influence includes the virtues of faith and charity, together with the gifts of intelligence and wisdom. Marie Dominique Chanou's earlier landmark towards understanding St. Thomas likewise emphasizes Augustine's massive impact on Aquinas and his medieval scholastic milieu. <coughs> Dauphiné, David, and Levering wisely caution against underestimating the difficulty of studying Augustine's influence on Aquinas and Aquinas's appropriation of Augustine, not least because few scholars today, uh, they think, are at home in both literatures and worlds. Uh, here's a quote. In the contemporary academy, historical study of Augustine necessarily takes place separately from the historical study of Aquinas. Those who study Aquinas may know less about Augustine than Aquinas did, 
or at least be less influenced by Augustine's thought. Against this backdrop, Chenu's firm grasp and deep appreciation of Augustine shine through. Note this perceptive description of the doctor of grace. And this is the first quote on your handout. The Latin civilization of the Middle Ages, truly a Christian product, was born out of Augustine. The convert rhetorician, the grammarian given to allegorical exegesis, the dialectician who, not without subtleness, found in his practice of dialectics remarkable resources for the formation of the mind and for its deepest religious pondering. Chenu describes Augustine's dialectic, this philosophic dialogic reflection that begins from shared opinions or shared truths held in common. So dialectic as culminating in, quote, a philosophy of participation, uh, an emphasis on unity distinct from, although not opposed to, the scholastic philosophic, quote, art of distinguishing, of determining and identifying things. Today's reflections will build on the analyses of Terrell, Dauphiné et al. and Chenu, among others. From their work, we might predict that to consider a set of Aquinas' references to and quotes from Augustine's works may reveal a shared intellectual and spiritual patrimony, together with some divergences of approaches, aims, and applications. And I think that's what we find considering Aquinas' use of Augustine's Book 19, especially of the City of God. Terrell observes that in Aquinas' early writings, Aristotle predominates over Augustine. St. Thomas's commentary on Lombard's sentences, for instance, contains over 2,000 citations of Aristotle, compared with only about 1,000 of Augustine. Still, it's noteworthy that Augustine is the second most cited author in that commentary. Augustine's influence, at least if we can judge by citation counts, and I'm aware that's not a wholly foolproof way of doing it, but Augustine's influence appears to increase as Aquinas' philosophic theology develops and deepens. In the Summa Theologiae's Prima Secundae, we find approximately 565 references to Aristotle, slash the philosopher, and about 535 to Augustine. If reference counts were a race, our competitors would be running neck and neck with Aristotle inches ahead. Then in the Secunda Secundae, Augustine catches up and takes a clear lead. Some 906 references compared with about 760 for Aristotle. And again, granted, we'd need to delve more deeply, at least and I've been able to at this point, into the nature of these references, which parts of each article and how they're used to make qualitative comparisons. Yet in terms of, excuse me, indicators of which works were on Aquinas' mind and how often each played into his dialogue and debate, quantitative comparisons may be revealing. Of the some 1,400, a little more than that, references to Augustine and his works in the Secunda Pars of the Summa, 175 refer to the city of God. As Leo Elders observes, and this is a quote two on your handout, excuse me here. So from Leo Elders, one can say without exaggeration that from the beginning of the Summa to its end, Augustine accompanies and sustains St. Thomas's effort of theological analysis and reflection. And again, the entire Summa Theologiae was written in dialogue with Augustine, end of quote. We can also say more concretely that the city of God provides inspiration and arguments for the Summa's second part, from its opening to its closing questions. The first references to the city of God come in question one of the Prima Secundae, while the final reference occurs in question 188, the penultimate question of the Secunda Secundae, so literally from beginning to almost the end. In the second part of the Summa, 
Aquinas references 17 of the 22 books of Augustine's City of God. So drawing from, from uh, a majority of, of the books of that work. It is book 19 of the City of God that especially frames the Summa's second part. As Dauphiné and his co-authors note, quote, Servi Pinkharis has emphasized how Aquinas's ethics, whose Aristotelian elements are evident, flows out of the Augustinian tradition in which beatitude plays a central role. The Prima Secundae opens with the question exploring the last end of humans, happiness or beatitude. It mirrors in this Augustine's famous dialogue with philosophic schools at the opening of Book 19. In the closing questions of the Secunde Secunde, Aquinas exercises his art of reducere, bringing arguments back around to their beginnings or principles, returning to beatitude, now under the aspect of diverse ways of life and the best way of life. And this theme again finds rich resources in the City of God, Book 19. Augustine opens Book 19 with the dialogue with philosophic schools on the nature of the last end or highest good for humans. In chapters four through nine, he surveys various candidates for the summum bonum, external goods, goods of body, and goods of the soul. Augustine concludes that none of these can constitute the last end. None can satisfy the human heart perfectly, that restless heart that we have. None can be secure in this life. Health can decline and fail. Vigor diminishes with age. Intellect is confused by mental illness or hampered by insufficient evidence. Virtues like courage and temperance struggle painfully against concupiscence. Bonds of family, friendship, and community, while highly valued by Augustine, still cause anxiety. Will my friend fall ill and die? Will he or she lapse into sin? Will injustice corrupt social life or violence undermine community and amity? From such considerations, Augustine concludes that the summum bonum is not a good we can partake of fully in this life, although our participation in it does commence here below in important ways. The last end can only be the vision of God, participation in divine filiation, and the life of friendship and love of the Trinity. Augustine describes this last end of the heavenly city and its members memorably as, quote, peace in life eternal or eternal life in peace. That's in chapter 11 of book 19. So in many respects, the opening, part, the opening of the second part of the Summa Theologiae reads as the summary of and commentary on these passages in the city of God. <coughs> Aquinas asks whether humans have a summum bonum and in what it consists. Along the way, he treats of, he discusses, most of the candidates Augustine dialogues with in Book 19, as well as some that Augustine has already discussed at length earlier in the City of God, especially in Books 4 and 5. These include wealth, honor, fame and glory, power. While Aquinas does not credit Augustine explicitly for his inquiry's plan and order, it's tranquillitas ordinis, we might say, Aquinas does reference the city of God at key junctures throughout what's come to be known as the treatise on the last end, questions one through five. In the response to article five, question one, Aquinas quotes from the first chapter of the city of God, book 19. Quote, since everything desires its own perfection, the human being desires his ultimate end, that which he desires as his perfect and crowning good. Hence Augustine, City of God 19, quote, in, uh, in speaking of the end, of good, we mean now not that it passes away so as to be no more, but that it is, it is perfected so as to be complete. In the set contra, question one, article six, Aquinas quotes from the same chapter. That is the end of our good for the sake of which we love other things, whereas we love it, the last end, for its own sake. In question two, article eight, Aquinas mirrors Augustine's consideration of created goods 
as possibilities for the last end and finds them all wanting. The said contra again shares a passage from the City of God, Book 19, this time from one of its concluding chapters. Aquinas writes, As the soul is the life of the body, so God is man's life of happiness, of whom it is written, Happy is that people whose God is the Lord. This is taken from the City of God. Similarly, in question five, Aquinas concludes that perfect happiness, beatitude, can be no human being's lot in this life. Here's a quote. For this present life is subject to many unavoidable evils, to ignorance on the part of the intellect, to inordinate affection on the part of the appetite, and to many penalties on the part of the body, as Augustine sets forth in The City of God, in Book 19. In question three of the Prima Secunde, Aquinas quotes from Augustine's confession that happiness is, quote, joy in the truth. Aquinas does this to support his argument concerning the essence of happiness. Quote, the essence of happiness consists in an act of the intellect, but the delight that results from happiness pertains to the will. End of quote. In, do, in so doing, however, Aquinas appears to criticize, or rather to clarify, Augustine's conclusion in the City of God, Book 19, that the last end of human beings is peace. Objection 1 refers to this Augustinian dictum, concluding that since peace pertains to the will, Aquinas writes, happiness resides in the will. In reply, Aquinas stresses, uh, and this is quote 3 from the handout, Peace pertains to the human being's last end, not as though it were the very essence of happiness, but because it is antecedent and consequent thereto. Antecedent insofar as all those things are removed which disturb and hinder a human being in attaining the last end. Consequent, as when a human being has attained the last end, he remains at peace, his desires being at rest. End of quote. So we can take a cue from St. Thomas now and move to the Secunda Secunde to question 29, which explores peace at greater length. Peace as a disposition or state of being with regard to oneself and to others. This question is, not surprisingly, the next portion of the Summa where Book 19 of the City of God factors significantly. Aquinas considers peace to be more than concord, Concordia, he writes, this is a paraphrase, requires only the union of wills between human beings. Whereas peace, pax, as Aquinas defines it, also requires a restful union among the faculties and desires of the person himself or herself. Aquinas uses this distinction between concord and peace to explain why Augustine speaks of peace among human beings as ordinata concordia, well-ordered concord. Yet even in this explanation, especially in reply to objection one, Aquinas implies that this distinction, concord and peace, uh, may be too technical to correspond to our ordinary speech and understanding. In the passage about peace being ordered concord, Aquinas writes, Augustine is, quote, speaking of that peace which is between one human being and another. And he says that this peace is concord, not indeed any kind of concord, but that which is well-ordered, through one human being agreeing with another in respect of something befitting to both of them, end of quote. So on Aquinas' explanation, peace includes and requires more than concord, at least perfect peace does, on Augustine's explanation, forms of well-ordered concord are forms of peace. Aquinas' argument in this question seems to concede the objection, if we put it that way, that Augustine's is the more natural mode of expression. Even as Aquinas' focus on that personal peace, which flows into social life and is an effect or act of charity, makes the distinction he draws between peace and concord both intelligible and helpful. In Article 2, uh, Aquinas turns to the question of the possibility that peace is our last end, whether all things desire peace. 
Referring again to City of God Book 19, in his said contra, Aquinas observes, quote, Augustine says that all things desire peace, and Dionysius says the same, end of quote. Aquinas' response underscores Augustine's affirmation that even humans motivated by evil wills some desire some form of peace. And here's a quote from the City of God that supports that from Book 19. Even robbers wish to have peace with their fellows, if only in order to invade the peace of others with greater force and safety. Everyone wants some form of peace. Aquinas' response to this question has something of an instrumentalist ring to it that Augustine's prose on peace never quite mirrors. This is from St. Thomas. It follows of necessity that whoever desires anything desires peace. At the same time, the good of peace, the positive intrinsic good, as Aquinas understands it, shines forth in some of his replies to objections. The replies to objections three and four resound especially with Augustinian sense and beauty, I think, while putting the thought of our church father in more precise syllogisms. Uh, and I, these are quotes five and six on the handout. I won't read them all, but they're really beautiful passages. I refer them to you. I'll just read a couple lines from each, from the first. Peace gives calm and unity to the appetite. Now, just as the appetite may tend to what is good simply or what is good apparently, so too peace may be either true or apparent. He goes on. Then the next quote. Since peace, true peace, is only about good things, as the true good is possessed in two ways, perfectly and imperfectly, so there is the twofold true peace. One is perfect peace. It consists in the perfect enjoyment of the sovereign good and unites all one's desires by giving them rest in one object. This is the last end of the rational creature. So we see there a very uh, robust and positive uh, gloss on, on Augustine's description of peace as our last end. Uh, so here we see, I think, this teaching is in accord with the one back in the Prima Secunde, Peace is antecedent and consequent to the last end. Uh, but here he gives us a richer sense of how we might understand that last end as a form of perfect peace. Uh, and in that regard, I think he's, it's, it's more deeply Augustinian. So as the saying goes, time is short and art is long. Um, in, in closing, I'll give a sketch of what, me, what might be a conclusion to this study. Highlighting three more moments, briefly, in the Summa, where we see Aquinas as the master, the, the master craftsman and the teacher of Augustine's patristic wisdom. Chenu and others have observed that Aquinas advances the inquiries Augustine began along scholastic philosophic lines, drawing more careful distinctions between concepts. At the same time, Chenu acknowledges that this approach can lessen the life and vibrancy of Augustine's rhetorical dialectical inquiries. Drawing too many distinctions or focusing too sharply on them distances us or risks distancing us from the unity and interconnectedness of life. And there's a, a quote that describes that, it's number seven. Uh, I will not read it here, but uh, yeah, you can see that there are some advantages, I think, even from a Thomas perspective to Augustine's uh, mode of thinking and writing. So, and, and here I didn't realize how uh, this may be a little controversial, but I'll put it out there anyway after. Uh, never thought of myself as a total egalitarian revolutionary, but I may be. Um, okay, so um, after our last, but that, that could be fun. We can have some debate perhaps. Um, so this, com this comparison may be seen in Aquinas' questions on the contemplative life, active life, religious state, episcopal state, and related themes at the end of the Summa's sec Secunda Pars. So the questions that begin with 179. In these questions, Augustine's City of God, Book 19, once again looms large. Augustine follows the ancient philosophic schools in considering the best way of life to lead in view of the last end or summum bonum, the active, the contemplative, the mixed. 
I won't go into detail here. Um, and, and here I am building on some work I've done with Colleen Mitchell, uh, now at Villanova University. Uh, but my sense is that Augustine in Book 19 purposefully de-emphasizes or blurs the distinctions among the classical ways of life. He does so to highlight the priority of charity in Christian living. To live a life of charity, we all need loving contemplation and loving action. In this we see Aquinas, uh, Augustine's mature thought compared with earlier works that highlighted the different ways of life more sharply, including some commentaries where Mary is the, the model of the contemplative life and Martha is the model of the active life, and Augustine really highlights the distinction. Um, but he doesn't, I, in my reading, he does not do that, uh, purposely does not do that in a sharp sense in the city of God. Aquinas, on his part, glosses these same texts in ways that underscore the distinctions among ways of life and the priority of one, although, as we heard earlier, in a qualified sense, one way perhaps a Carthusian, another way perhaps a Dominican, but a uh, uh, way of life over the others. Chenu, in Aquinas and his role in theology, suggests that Aquinas follows particularly Gregory the Great's commentary on this theme, the active and the contemplative life. Um, while in some sense Aquinas achieves greater analytical clarity than Augustine offers, some of Augustine's pastoral wisdom and unifying vision may be obscured. And also, again, the defense of the mendicant and Dominican way of life may be also a, a, obviously a priority for St. Thomas that wasn't for St. Augustine. So we can conclude these reflections with the theme massively present in Augustine's City of God and elaborated with care and originality in the Summa Theologiae, the virtue of humility and its vicious foil, superbia, hubris, or pride, as Chenu notes, quote, contemplation is for Aquinas the privilege of the humble. And that's a very Augustinian thought. For his part, Augustine in his preface frames the entire city of God as the defense of humility's great virtue, the surprising paradoxical excellence or power of the virtue of littleness, of connection with the earth or humus. It will not be easy, he writes, to convince the proud of this new virtue, but with God's help, he will try in this great and arduous work, as he describes it. Aquinas, placing the Christian vision and Augustinian themes in dialogue with Aristotle, contributes greatly in the Summa to the development of humility studies by pairing humility with magnanimity as duplex virtus. And we see the Aristotelian influence there, uh, and also Aquinas' originality. Augustine's City of God offers no definition of humility, nor even a succinct depiction, and so it's not surprising that Aquinas employs other writings of Augustine in question 161 of the Summa with uh, Secunda Secunde on humility. In question 162 on pride superbia, by contrast, Aquinas finds usable passages from the City of God to incorporate. In Article 1, Aquinas asks whether superbia is sinful. Uh, uh, and and his, uh, so his second objection is a quote from Confessions. Quote, pride imitates exaltedness, whereas thou alone art God exalted above all. End of quote. So why would it not be a virtue to imitate God in this way? Uh, Aquinas' reply takes inspiration from Book 19 of the City of God. Augustine says that pride is, quote, the desire for inordinate exaltation. And so Aquinas argues that pride desires excellence in excess of right reason. This is quote nine on the handout. And hence it is, as Augustine asserts, that, quote from Augustine, pride imitates God inordinately, for it hates an equality of fellowship under him and wishes to usurp his dominion over our fellow creatures, end of quote. Aquinas' conceptual clarification of humility, precious as it is for inquirers into this virtue, may yet come with a cost. It becomes narrower as it becomes more precise and seems to transfer its psychological subject from the core, the innermost being, the mind and, and heart, in Augustine, 
to the irascible passions in Aquinas' thought. Humility may become less of a foundation and a vital force, perhaps, than it was for Augustine, as it becomes a more clearly delineated character trait. All of which brings us back to Servi Pinkers and his sources in Christian ethics, and the founder of our feast today with the Pinkers chair. Pinkers indicates that we need Augustine and the other fathers, as well as Aquinas. Aquinas's incorporation and understanding of patristic wisdom shows him to be a true master and teacher, magister spiritualis. Yet, we also see in returning to Augustine, as inspired by St. Thomas, that each thinker has his own insight and beauty that no synthesis can aptly capture. Thank you.